All right, this is a basic overview of programming in R. To be honest, I, this is one of those things, I, it's hard to know where to start uh, in terms of an R course. I've taught a few different R courses before. One place that I normally start is a personal story about the first time I learned how to program uh, in undergraduate. My advisor sat me down in a room he said, this is where you're gonna be learning to program. He pointed to under the desk and I looked under the desk and there was a big hole in the wall. And he said, that's where you kick the wall. And basically I kicked that wall a lot because it's pretty frustrating. There's lots of things you just don't know and you feel like you're in the dark until you get it. And once you get it, things seem kind of easy. So I'm at a place now where I know how to program in R pretty well. And I'm trying to remember what it's like not to know and um, I've got listed up here some important aspects of basic programming, variables, logic, loops, writing algorithms, writing functions. Once you master these basic parts of writing programs, um, you can probably pick up uh, lots of different languages and put them to all kinds of use um, for data analysis and beyond. Uh, these are the kind of basic Lego building blocks of programming languages that let you uh, control what your computer is doing. And let me also say, as we work through the labs each week in the statistics course, the goal of each lab is to make them containable for the roughly hour and a half that we have each week, and not to totally overload you uh, with the task of both learning statistics at a high level and learning how to program in R. Uh, we're using R in this case to help us learn about statistics, and we'll pick up some information about how to become uh, familiar and uh, fluent in some basic R programming that can take you well beyond some canned approaches to doing statistical analysis in R. I do have a goal of making individual screencasts for each of these basic programming topics, but in this video I'm going to present an example that kind of does them all in one shot to give you a general sense of some of the things you'll be interacting with with our studio. So I've made a new project called Programming Basics, and I'm gonna make an R Markdown document, and I'm gonna call it my underscore mean. And there it is. I'm gonna quickly save this as mean. Now, there it is. And I'm going to delete all this stuff here. This is from the template. I'm going to press knit and I'm going to see that we've started up with basically a blank document. We're going to be using R Markdown a lot in this course for assignments and sometimes you'll make your own R Markdown documents and sometimes they'll be provided to you and you will kind of modify them and do various things. So part of, uh, part of our task here is not only to learn about some of these basics in terms of uh, programming in R, but also how to use an R Markdown document. And don't worry, this is just an overview to give you a feeling. And when we meet in class or online and throughout making additional videos and with lots of feedback, we'll be able to hopefully clarify all sorts of little details that pop up here. So let's get started. Let's say I had a goal. I want to calculate the mean of some numbers in R. I'm starting out with this example because I'm assuming you probably already know what the mean or the average is. Uh, let's see, the average or the mean is the sum of the numbers divided by the number of numbers, right? Okay. So if we're gonna calculate the mean of some numbers, we would need to have some numbers first. And this is where variables come in, the first thing on our list. So let's create some numbers in R. And I'm gonna do that first by making an R code chunk in my R markdown document. It's three backticks, 
a left curly brace and it auto completes and makes a right one for me and you put a little r a lowercase r in there when you do that notice it turns gray and you get a little play button you want to go to the next line and do three more back ticks and this closes this off so we've made a little sandwich this is the top part of the sandwich this is the bottom part inside the middle is where we put our r code so i would like to create some numbers and i would like to put them in a little variable that i name myself i'm going to call this variable my numbers i can call this variable anything i want but uh, you and so can you you can call it your numbers or x or whatever you want so this is the name of my variable now i want to assign into this variable any numbers i wish i'm going to press the less than symbol and a dash this is called the assignment operator and anything to the right of the assignment operator over here is going to get put into this variable over here to put in a bunch of numbers, we can use this C command, type the letter C, a left parenthesis and a right par parenthesis, and now we can enter numbers in between commas, just like this, one comma between every different number. And I press play, and we've now created a variable called my numbers, and it contains all these numbers we put in there. To verify this, you can type the name of your variable and press enter in the console and it will print out the numbers for you. This is great. We've now, uh, I mean, we could put different numbers in there if we wanted, but we now have a variable that has some numbers in it. So how could we use R to calculate the mean? This gets down to the very bottom, which will be using a mean function to sum up all of these numbers and divide by the number of numbers. I'll let you know right away, it's really easy. You just type the word mean, use parentheses, and then inside of here, you put the variable containing your numbers. And the name of that variable is my, whoops, I made a mistake, my underscore numbers. And you just run that line of code and you get the mean printed out. Now I'm going to pause and say there's a couple things I've kind of glossed over. This R code chunk has two pieces of code in it. If you copy that out and put it into the console by pasting it and pressing enter, it will run both of those things. You can press play and it will run both of those things from the first to the second in order from top to bottom. You can also highlight these things and press command return. That's on a Mac. Those are different ways to run these commands. And all we've done here is we've created a variable, stored some numbers in it, and we've run a function on that variable. Let's consider the problem of restricting outliers in some data. Consider the possibility these numbers came from um, some measurements that you took in the real world. And let's say it's possible uh, that those measurements could range from zero to 10. It's impossible to get a number higher than 10. Look at these numbers. There's a number 77 in there. If this was real data, you would know automatically just by looking at it that a 77 is impossible, probably a data entry error, some kind of error. It's, it happens all the time that you'll get some messed up numbers in your data. So, um, what if you wanted to calculate the mean of some numbers like these, but also eliminate numbers that are impossible or numbers according to some criterion? This is sometimes called restricting outliers or outlier elimination. I'm bringing this up as a real world data analysis example that uh, can help us uh, overview the other things in this list, logic, loops, writing an algorithm and writing a function. So the first thing I want to talk about is logic. And um, we can use uh, logic statements in R to 
assess whether certain things are true or false. And then depending on whether something is true or false, take a particular kind of action. Logical steps and assessment take different forms. Um, let me just show you a few different ones. I'm going to type the variable my numbers. And I'm going to say two equals and the number five. When we do this, uh, we are evaluating the question, which of the values in the variable my numbers is equal to the number five. Let's press play and see what happens. We get a series of true and false values and uh, referring to the locations in the vector. So the first one is true and that is true. The first thing is a five. Then the next three aren't five. And then the, this one is a five. So there's two trues and the rest are false. So this is just an example of uh, evaluating whether particular values are uh, a five. There's many other logical operators. There's greater than, so we could do this one. And um, in this case, uh, five, three, two, four, and five are not greater than five. The other ones are. We could do less than. We could do greater than and or equal to. Um, and a full discussion of all of these options starts getting us away from the goal, which is to provide a quick overview. Um, many times we'll have a simple goal, such as we're trying to eliminate numbers from our list that are greater than 10 because we define those as impossible. Uh, how do we do that using some of these things we've seen here? For example, if we said my numbers less than or equal to 10, uh, we would get a vector of Boolean statements. These all true except for this one is false. That's the ninth location. That's this one here. And imagine we could filter this variable so that only the ones that were lined up with the trues would be returned and the one that was lined up with the false wouldn't be returned. This would be a way of getting rid of this value. So it turns out we can do that using indexing, using square brackets. When we follow a variable with square brackets, we can place numbers into here and return values in locations in the variable. So the first location is a five. The second location is a three and so on. The first to fifth location with a colon there are these first five numbers. If we place this logic statement inside the square brackets, we return all the values that are less than or equal to 10. And this removes the 77. So if we wanted to write a function that eliminated numbers that were impossible, like ones greater than 10 in our example, we could simply do this. Place uh, all of this inside the mean function. And then we get our answer here. Let's try to solve this very same problem again using a slightly different version of logic statements in combination with a loop. And uh, you'll find out that there's lots of different ways to write code to solve the very same problem. And let's establish again just that our problem is to eliminate numbers from our list, ours from our variable that are greater than 10. Okay, first of all, I want to introduce you to uh, if-then statements. So there's a common pattern here. You type the word if, parentheses, and we can, inside the parentheses, create a logic statement. Let me just do something, um, heads equals one.
Okay. Check this out. Uh, actually, I'm going to replace this if then with sort of if else, but they mean the same thing more or less. <laughs> um, okay. Let's think about what something like this can do. First of all, if we press play, nothing's going to happen. And, oh, we got an error, so something did happen. Um, and this is good to point out, this is about syntax, so I've forgotten something. This equals sign, uh, let's go up here, do heads equals one. Okay, if we do that, we create a variable called heads with a one in it. This is equivalent to writing uh, this line here with the assignment operator. So if we do that, the, the very same thing happens. Good practice and common style in R is to always use the assignment operator to assign a value to a variable and do not use the equal sign to do this. So I'm just going to delete that. Actually, I'm going to comment it out and press the hashtag in front of this. This makes it green so this line of code won't run. Um, that's why this part didn't work. What needs to be in between the parentheses is a logical statement. And we want to logically evaluate whether the variable heads contains a one. To do that, we need two equal signs just like we had up here, two equal signs. Okay, now we can run this. And basically nothing happens. We return null. We're asking a question and we're saying, if our variable contains a one, we're gonna do something. I'm just gonna write do something, uh, if one, do something else if not one, basically, we've made two little spots in between the parentheses, so, or sorry, in between the curly braces. Here's a two curly braces. Anything we put in between here will occur if this part is true. Anything we put here will occur if it's not true. So I'm gonna say, let's do something like this. If our variable heads contains one, let's print the word heads. And if it isn't, let's print the word tails. So I'm gonna press play. And we can see that the word heads is being printed. That's because the variable heads contains one and this happens, not this part. If we made this a two, then uh, this part will be false because heads will not be a one. And instead of getting heads, we'll print tails. So you can use if statements to evaluate something for its truth in terms of, you know, something is the same as something else or bigger or smaller. There's various other comparisons you can make. And then you can do something in one case, depending on what evaluates, and do something else in the other case. All right, um, if we were to take this code and kind of um, make a series of gates, or sorry, and, and apply it to our previous problem. Let's just do some copy and pasting. I'm gonna copy and paste all of this stuff right here. I'm going to use a variable x. And this is going to stand for a particular number. Imagine x could be any one of these numbers in here in my numbers. And I want to ask the question, is x less than or equal to 10? Remember, that was our original problem. And then what do we want to do if our x is less than 10? Um, this is a good question. 
let's try something a little bit more programmatic in terms of growing a variable. I want to create a variable and let's call it my var. And I'm going to initialize it with a C and two parentheses. This is going to contain null or empty because I've not put anything in there. Now, if I want to add something to this variable, I could do that by this following method. This is kind of strange, but just bear with me. Actually, I'm going to copy this into here. And I want to show you that what happens if we can combine a variable with itself and a new number? So let's take a look at this statement. I'm going to run it. Notice my variable now contains the number one. Let's run this one line again. So copy it, command return. Now it has two numbers in it and they're both ones. This now has three ones. What's going on here? Well, my var has three ones in it. And if I combine the current state of my var, which has three ones in it, with any other number, let's say a five, I will add a five to it. So I'm combining these first three numbers with the next number. We could combine all sorts of things. We could combine this variable with three more numbers, and it would combine. So we're basically using the C command to combine things. Let's go back to this state. So I've assigned this variable, uh, again, just an empty state. And what I want to do is say, I'm going to add to my variable the value of x if it is le less than 10. And otherwise, I'm not going to do anything. So let's check out what happens here. Um, I'm just going to move some things around just so we can kind of see them. So we've, we've set a, made an empty variable here. Now we're going to put a 2 into x, and we're going to run this line of code. And what we see is a 2 gets added to my variable because uh, 2 is less than 10, so this part will occur. Let's make it a 5. Let's make the x a 5 and run this again. Oh, now a 5 has been added to the end. Let's make x a 50. So in this case, what should happen is that it will be false that x is less than 10. So this part of the function, or the statement, should not occur. We should not add a 50 to the end. We run the, this line of code, and we see that uh, we indeed did not add a 50. And you could test this out. Any number up to 10, when you run this, will get added. OK. I'll just give you one more quick example of a uh, different kind of syntax. Just get you used to the idea that the same thing can appear in slightly different ways and accomplish the same goal. I'm going to copy all of this down here. And in, in, in this particular case, we only do this thing whenever x is less than 10. In, in the other case, we don't do anything. So we don't even, that all this part is just kind of being wasted because we don't have anything else to do. Turns out you can delete it and write it just like this. Uh, you don't even need the curly braces. And so, for example, if we run this, every time we run it, we'll keep adding another number as long as, as, long as the x is less than 10. All right, now let's talk about loops. We're going to combine some of our logic with some loops in order to systematically go through the numbers 
in my numbers and eliminate ones that are greater than 10. Okay, first of all, and before we do that, let me just talk about loops briefly. Uh, like I said, we'll go into more depth on each of these in other videos, but a lot of times you'll find yourself having to repeat some task. For example, if we were to go through each of the numbers right here, five, three, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, and check whether they are less than, less than or equal to 10, we have to do that 10 times. I mean, I'm just kind of doing it in my head right now or out loud. Is five less than 10? Yes. Is three less than or equal to 10? Yes. Is two less than or equal to 10? Yes. And so on. Um, we're repeatedly applying the same question to each of the individual elements. Wouldn't it be nice if you could automate that process? Well, we can using something called loops. And a loop allows you to repeatedly apply a particular um, set of code over and over again. Uh, and this takes the work out of doing something tedious. And here's a, there's different ways to, to use loops in R. Here's one called the for loop. It has a similar kind of structure. Uh, we write the word for, we've got these parentheses, then we've got these curly braces. And I'm just gonna give you an example here. We're saying for i in one to 10, and then anything that we do in the braces is going to occur each iteration of the loop. So let's look at this one here. I'm gonna press play. And what happens is uh, we print out the value of i each iteration of the loop. Um, this part, one to 10, what does that do? Let's copy it in and press enter. Well, it actually creates the numbers one to 10. When we put it in this loop, um, at the very first step of the loop, and I'm just going to, at the very first step of the loop, i will equal one, because that's the first thing. And when i equals one, the stuff in here will happen. So at this point, we're printing whatever i is. Okay, we've done that, and that actually causes this to happen, the very first printing job occurs and what gets printed is a one. So after we're done this part, we do a loop and now I becomes the next thing. The next thing is a two. So I becomes a two. And then as I is a two, we print that and so on. And it prints out all these things. Um, we could put anything in here. We could say one plus one. Now, what would this do? Well, uh, I is going to go through the values one to 10. So there's gonna be 10 cycles of the loop. Every cycle, it will execute this line of code. And all this line of code does is do one plus one equals two. So we should see two, 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 two um, happen 10 total times. Press play. Um, it did happen, I <laughs> but it didn't get printed. So let's do the printing and we could do it like this. There we go. So we could see that this is a way to have um, uh, an operation get carried out 10 times. So when we combine logic with the ability to loop over things, uh, we create a very powerful process capable of accomplishing algorithms. So we might want to do a kind of algorithm that's gonna be a step-by-step -step, uh, recipe that can help us eliminate big numbers in our variable. So let's go back to the problem of checking each of the values in our variable and eliminating them if they're greater than 10. So how can we combine uh, 
loops with this kind of logic to restrict these outliers. Let's try it. Um, in this example, I'm going to show you that uh, the way that looping works in R is uh, kind of interesting. So I'm going to do for I, and again, this is the name of a variable. This could be anything. Let's make it J or jar or whatever you want. Let's call it J for J in. And now instead of going one to 10, let's just put the name of our variable, my numbers. Now, what do you think is going to happen here if we run this loop? Well, the first iteration of the loop, j will be equal to the very first element of my numbers, which is a 5. So j will be a 5. And then on the second iteration, j will become a 3, and so on uh, throughout these numbers. And we can verify just by saying print j. I find this is useful. If you don't know what, some, what something's doing, you know, printing things out and looking at them to verify, it makes a lot of, helps make sense. Okay, so it printed out all of the numbers from 5, 3, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 77, and 6. Great. Um, well, let's build off of this and say, if, and then we're gonna say j less than or equal to 10, curly brace, print j. So now we've uh, created a loop where we're going to go through each of our numbers and we're going to evaluate whether the number is less than 10, sorry, less than or equal to 10. And if it is, we'll print that value. And here we just did that. And look, we've eliminated our 77. Okay, so this is pretty cool. This is what we wanted to do. We have used uh, logic statements and loops to accomplish our goal here of evaluating and eliminating numbers based on some criteria. All right, next we're going to talk a little bit more about algorithms and functions, and we're going to focus on the mean. I've already shown you that if you write the word mean and put some numbers in there, like my numbers, we can calculate means pretty easily. And the numbers, by the way, they don't have to be in a variable. You could uh, do it like this. So let's say you wanted to find the mean of the numbers between one and 10, you could do that. If you wanted to find the mean of some numbers by hand, like say one, six, five, four, five, six, you could do this. Uh, as long as you insert in between these parentheses a vector of numbers, uh, you'll be able to calculate the mean. Now it's worth uh, understanding, and we'll get there throughout the semester, but I'm just going to point out now, it's worth understanding how to write your own functions. Like, how is it that R is actually calculating this mean? What is the mean function? In general, functions have some name followed by parentheses that you can use. There's a whole bunch of them and uh, we'll become familiar with many of them uh, at, throughout. If you type the name of a function and press return, make sure sometimes it'll try to, there we go. Um, you'll actually see that function printed out in R. This, in this case, it's not super helpful to understand how it works. But let me uh, give you a different way we could find the mean of some numbers. I mean, we already know that the uh, mean itself is a, a sum in the numerator and the number of numbers in the denominator. So one way we could find this is to separately calculate the sum. It turns out there's a sum function. So the sum of these numbers is 123. The length function counts how many different numbers there are. 
10. So if we did this, just copying it going down here, put this all on the same line and put a slash there, we're going to be dividing the sum by the length and we get the mean. So again, we have this question, like how do you compute this? How do you write the sum function? How do you get the length function? I'm going to go back up to this loop here and I'm going to show you one last example of using this strategy of loops and a little bit of logic and a little bit of variable management for us to create an algorithm that computes uh, the pieces of the mean. Um, and then I'll show you how we can write our own function in R. So I'm going to copy all of this. I'm going to go down to the bottom, create another R code chunk. And I, as an option command I, I'm going to paste this in here. And now we're going to look at a few basic tricks that you could use to uh, to employ basic programming building blocks to solve this problem. So there's two problems we have. Calculate the sum and calculate the number of numbers or the count. Let's start with the count. So how many numbers do we have? I'm going to create a variable called the count. I'm going to put a zero into it. So it starts off as zero. There it is, has a zero in it. And I want to increase the value of this variable every time we loop through the numbers in this variable. So how could we do that? Well, um, inside of our loop here, we could say the count will be assigned the value of itself plus one on every step of the loop. So every time we loop around in here, uh, let's consider what happens on the very first step. I'm actually going to uh, just erase all of this to track this here. And we're going to say loop. It's going to loop one, two, three, four, five, six. These are the steps, or the, and we're going to keep on going to 10. So every time, um, I guess we're just going to talk about the values of the various things at each step. So the value of j on the first iteration will be the first number in my numbers. And that's a five. Okay, the value of the count, well, it's going to be zero plus one. So it will become a one. On the next step, um, j will be a three. The count is the count plus one. So the count already is a one plus a one will be a two. And then j will be two. And the count is now a two plus one equals three. So as you can see, this variable starts incrementing. If we run all of this, um, what we're seeing printed out are the values of my numbers. And we can also see that the count ends up as a 10 right because it goes through every one of the numbers if we only want to keep the values that are actually smaller than uh, smaller than or equal to 10 we would have to put this one inside of our if statement now we'll only in increment the counter um, in, in the condition when the value of j is less than or equal to 10. Now I just want to do something quickly here and notice what I'm doing. I'm highlighting up to line 114. 
and I'm going to run this, and I'm not running line 112. So currently the value of count is 10. I'm just going to run this loop. Here we go. Now we've gone up to 19. Um, and notice there aren't 19 numbers in my numbers. That's important. We never initialize the count back to zero in the first place. If we press play, it's going to start from the beginning, go down to the end. So it starts off at zero. And now the count is nine because um, only nine of these numbers are less than or equal to 10. All right, so we've got the count. How about the sum? How are we going to get the sum using some of our basic ideas? Well, let's start off and make a variable called the sum and assign it a value of zero. So we've got this thing that starts off as a zero. And what we want to do is add into this variable uh, every time uh, that our number is less than or equal to 10. So we're going to do that in here. We say the sum equals the sum, which is a, whatever it current value is and plus what well if we did plus j it's going to add a 5 in then a 3 in then a 2 and a 4 and so on and it won't add the 77 in because it's not less than or equal to 10. Let's press play. Now we can see here that our sum is 46 and our count is 9. Um, great at the end of the day, we could say, let us take the sum and divide it by the count. And here we get the mean we were looking for. All right, let's keep going. The last thing I want to talk about is writing a function in R. We've just accomplished uh, an algorithm that calculates a mean and restricts a value. Um, that is, it eliminates values that are less than or equal to 10. Um, we could imagine applying this kind of algorithm to a variable that had lots of different numbers in it. They don't just have to have 10 numbers. It could be any number of numbers. And we might even want to change the restriction to being less than or equal to any number that we want. Uh, we can put this kind of code into a function like the mean function that we already saw. And this makes the code more portable and easier to reuse. Let's look at how we would do that. So I'm going to write my mean. And just like we can assign in numbers and things like that to a variable, I'm notice I'm using the assignment operator. We're going to assign here a function to this variable. When we do this, we get a new thing in our global environment called functions. Now we've got a my mean function. Now the way functions work is they take in some value like x and they output some value. So we could use return, let's say x plus 1. Let's see what, this is not going to compute the mean, but what does it do? Well, we've now loaded our function into the environment. We now have to type its name, and we can give it a value such as 3 and run the function. This takes in the value 3, assigns it to x, and then we return the value of x plus 1. So if x is a 3, it comes out as 4. If x is a 6, it comes out as a 7. So we've got our inputs. We do something here. And we could do, I mean, just to kind of make it a little bit longer, just to give you an example, we do something in the middle of the function before we transform something, and then we return the value. So here, it's going to do the very same thing. It's just we're taking an intermediate step of, um, let's see, my mean 6. That'll give us 7. And just walk through what's happened. 
x has been assigned a 6. Here we take x plus 1, which is going to be a 7, assign that to y, which is a, variable, a new variable that we made, and then we return the value of y, so we get a 7. Now, we can have multiple input variables. In our mean function, we want to, well, let's just make it simple, numbers. We want to put some numbers in, and we want to put a maximum value in. And we want both of these things to be part of our algorithm. Before, we've been using the maximum value of 10, so you can actually supply that as a default. Then we need to write our function. We've basically written that up here. So let's see what would happen if we were to copy all of this, put it in here, and then talk about anything we need to modify for it to work. OK. So oh. there's a good practice that you want to indent by pressing tab. Uh, just, I guess. So things line up in a particular way, just like that. So anything in our function is indented a little bit. Um, anything inside the for loop is indented, and anything inside the if statement is indented. And it just makes it a little easier to read. OK, so when we run this function, what's going to happen is inside the function, we initialize two variables called the count and the sum to 0. Then we loop through uh, the values inside, and we have this as my numbers, but we want to connect that to the input variable name called numbers. And we want to evaluate whether the uh, value of j at each step in the numbers will be less than or equal to some value. Now here we have hard-coded that as a 10, but if we change this to max value, is the name up here, we can later change this from a 10 to a different value, and it will uh, keep any number less than or equal to that value that we specify. I don't think we need this print statement anymore. And that's basically it. Let's check it out. Let's run this. So we've got our function in there. Now we can type my mean, and we can use our original numbers, my numbers, and we could put max value equals 10 and run it. And we got 5.111. Great. What's cool about this is that you could set the max value to some other number, and it will restrict those. And you could put... Um, any numbers in here. So for example, I'll just quickly show you that uh, if we use the rnorm function, um, this particular function generated 1,000 different numbers from a normal distribution uh, with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 100. Let's just put those quickly into the variable a. So there's a thousand numbers in there. We could just quickly look at them. Hist A, we should be able to see oh, the histogram is over here. This is basically how our numbers are distributed. And if we wanted to use our function, right, we could do it just like this. And our max value, let's say, is going to be 10 again. And so we've now applied our function on a data, a variable with a thousand numbers rather than 10. Okay. So that was an overview of using variables, loops, logic, writing an algorithm, writing a function in R. It gives you a kind of flavor of some of the things you'll be working with. And we'll go into more detail about each of those elements as we progress through the semester. And that's all for this video. Thank you.